Welcome to the first episode of Unnamed Women of the New Testament. This is a special bonus series from the Sunday on Monday podcast, and it's brought to you by LDS Living and Deseret Bookshelf Plus. The Sunday on Monday podcast is a come follow me podcast. It's where we take the come follow me lesson for the week and we really dig into the scriptures together. So if you want to know more about the podcast, click in the link in our description, or you can go to deseretbook.com slash Sunday on Monday. It's going to take you to Deseret Bookshelf Plus, where you can sign up for a free 30-day trial for Desert Bookshelf Plus. It is awesome. Now, here's my favorite thing about the podcast and this bonus series. Each week, I get to invite my friends to come and join me and discuss the scriptures, and we bring our knowledge and feelings and experiences and humor to the table. It's pretty amazing. I love it so much. And today, I am so excited to introduce you to my friend, Camille Frank Olson. Hello, Camille. Hello. Here we are. Okay. Are you ready to do this? <laughs> yes, very now, much. Listen, everybody, the reason I invited Camille, and for the record, she will be with us all year for every episode of Unnamed Women of the New Testament because Camille has paid the price to know about these women. She is a former professor at BYU. She is an author. She has authored two books that I always recommend. You cannot study the Old Testament without her book, Women of the Old Testament, and you cannot study the New Testament without her other book, women of the New Testament. They are beautiful companions to these two books of scripture. But here's something really cool about Camille. Did you guys know she is the very first female scholar to create the women in scriptures class? Hello, that is the coolest. And Camille, tell us something really cool about this class. BYU Hawaii and BYU Idaho has made it part of their regular curriculum. Yes, as it should be. Kudos to BYU Hawaii and BYU Idaho. I love you guys. And Camille wrote the curriculum. That's what's so neat. So I cannot wait for what she has to share with us this year. And when we talked about the episodes that we're going to do, it was so fun to just work with her and get her insights. And we both agreed that in order to start the Unnamed Women of the New Testament series, we have to begin at the beginning. So we are going to dig into a very important and significant genealogy, and it's found in Matthew chapter one. Now, if you have your scriptures, go to Matthew chapter one. If you don't, you can follow along and then later go back and mark it. There are two genealogies in the New Testament. We're going to focus on Matthew chapter one, verses one through 16. This is the legal descent of Jesus Christ. It's the line of Joseph. The second genealogy you can go and mark is found in Luke chapter three. It's verses 23 through 38. This is Mary's genealogical line or the Savior's natural descent. So I think that's really important for us to know there's a legal descent and a natural descent that we want to be aware of in scripture. So let's just jump into Matthew chapter one. Okay, Camille, here we go. First of all, tell us in this genealogical line in verses three, five, and six are the names of women. Why is it significant that women are even mentioned in this genealogical line? Well, if we recall our study this year in the Old Testament, whenever we ran into genealogical lineages that were recorded in the Old Testament, I think we come away with the idea, you rarely if ever see women. It's highly uncommon. And especially when you think about the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew is the most Jewish of all of the Gospels, and and women did not figure importantly in those kind of communications. Genealogy was figured at that time that the focus was on the man, the fathers, Mm -hmm. not the mothers. And so to find any women in this genealogy in the Gospel of Matthew is, you, you It would have taken the readers um, at that time by surprise. Now, had it been in the Luke one, it would not because you read Luke and Luke is very inclusive and he Mm -hmm. does more with women than any of the other gospel writers. But this is Matthew that does it. And so, yes, it is very (laughs) surprising. Well, I like that you said he's the most Jewish and his goal is to teach the Jews. He is writing Mm -hmm. to the Jews. So it is surprising that he would have even included women in this because the Jews, like you said, they weren't even, women weren't even included in censuses. Mm -hmm. They would go house to house and just find out information about men. So this is pretty exciting that Matthew decides, let's include some women here. 
And then look, who does he include? Which women? (laughs) It's not the ones you would think. Not at all. Tell us who he includes in the genealogy. Well, first to to recognize Matthew starts his genealogy with Abraham, Mm -hmm. which makes sense to a Jewish audience. Right. Here's the house of Israel. Whereas Luke takes his all the way back to Adam, who is the son of God which is all inclusive of everyone, Gentiles and Jews. But this is a very Jewish genealogy. And so if you're starting with Abraham, it would be, you're saying there's some women in it. Wouldn't you expect Sarah? Yes. How about Rebecca? (laughs) And then when you get to Jacob, Leah is the one that leads to this lineage of the tribe of Judah. Mm -hmm. But it isn't until you get to Judah and, and, and his wife, if we can say, is Tamar, which typically we don't even read. I mean, she's got a whole chapter in the book of Genesis, but people don't know that. So it's easy to just skip right over her. Then we get Rahab, Mm -hmm. the harlot, who lives in Jericho. And then we get Ruth, the Moabitess um, in the book of Ruth. Mm -hmm. And finally, we get her who had been the wife of Uriah. We don't even get her name there, but if we know our Old Testament, we know who that is because this is the one who has children, has the son Solomon, where this royal lineage continues. This is Bathsheba, isn't it? So Mm -hmm. those are the, and then it leads down to Mary. And if I could just add this, I think it's because in the wording, the way it is there, I would even like to argue and we might not do it here, but this could be Mary's lineage as well. Because if Jesus is inheritor of the blood of David in the flesh, that just can't be Joseph. It has to be Mary as well. Oh, absolutely. Well, I like that you just said that because it could be. One of the things we know is that the, the fathers that are named for Joseph were brothers. And so we we always say they were cousins, but we don't know which father was which to which Mary or Joseph. So I think you are right. And I like the way you put that. And we also just have to recognize that for every man that's named in this genealogy, there's a wife. And Mm -hmm. so we have countless unnamed women in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And And, and, and I know I keep interrupting you, but go ahead. I love this, Camille. I mean, there was one woman in the royal lineage that actually was queen um, of Judah that was a descendant there. And she's not named. She was horrible. Remember Athalia, the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel? She was the queen. She's not listed there. I guess you'd have to argue she wasn't literally in that lineage, but she married one who was and Mm -hmm. killed all of her sons and grandsons so she could be the queen. But, you know, so it's, it's, so It's very pick and he chooses which people he's putting in this, doesn't he? He definitely does. He's not trying to do every single one who ruled in that line. No. And he's so specific with these women. And many people will say, oh, well, he chose these women because of their kind of sordid, salacious storyline that goes along with it. And and a lot of people are like, well, why would he include those women if they were so bad or if they had a storyline? And one of the things I appreciated the most was in your book, you give four different reasons why they're included. I'm just going to mention these briefly. And if you have anything you want to add, please do. But one of the reasons was these women were obvious sinners in need of redemption. So that's one reason why these four women are named. The second reason, these women were not Israelites. The third reason, these women were accused of bearing illegitimate children, which I love that you debunk that one in your book for sure. (laughs) And then the last one, these women were originally considered to have behaved scandalously, but were later recognized for their wisdom in preserving the Messiah's lineage. Now, I know which one holds true to me, but which one do you like the most? Well, I think you can debunk the first one too. If you needed someone in that lineage to show that there were sinners. You didn't need to bring in those women. There are some (laughs) of those kings that are listed that are far worse. Um, But there is something about the one about them being not Israelites. We know that Ruth and Mm -hmm. Rahab definitely were not, but we really can't be sure about Bathsheba and 
to Mar. It, you've got great arguments on both sides. Yeah. And if that's it, then it seems like Matthew wanted to explore the idea that, or just really reinforce that the gospel of Jesus Christ was not bound to only those directly born into that lineage, but that could expand to others. But then it makes you question why Mary, I mean, very easily and directly, Matthew finds a way to make sure that Mary is the fifth woman here. Mm -hmm. And so it's that fourth one in that list that really rings true to me, especially when we consider that there were those that likely believed all of Mary's life that she had conceived Jesus out of sin. Mm -hmm. Remember that from John 8, when he's talking to the Jewish leaders and they say to Jesus, we were not born of fornication. Now, if they're saying that that you get this, it's not a whole lot, but I think there's something in there that there are rumors that have spread. And I just can't help but think that Matthew, knowing what he did and know some of the, the rationale people would have to reject Jesus just simply because his paternity was unknown. Mm -hmm. Here is Matthew talking to that audience. These Jewish friends and neighbors and countrymen do not discount Jesus because we don't know who his father is or that we think his mother lived in sin when she conceived him. Look at these women Mm. from our history that were likewise first falsely accused of scandal. And then we found out they were the heroines in the story and preserved this lineage. They were the rescuers. And, yes. and in that way, he starts preparing his audience to set aside any questions they have about Jesus's paternity and what Mary was like and can focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think it's brilliant for that audience. Oh, absolutely. I mean, to set aside their biases, that is huge. And that is exactly what he's asking them to do. And I appreciate how in this last one that you use the word wisdom. He recognized their wisdom, the women's wisdom in preserving the Messiah's lineage. And so again, there's a bias that women weren't smart, that women weren't educated, that women didn't have a voice. And so he uses these four women. Oh boy, do their stories ever teach us so much. They are so wise. And so we're going to talk about their stories. And before we get into the stories of each one of these women, I want us to be thinking about this throughout the rest of our conversation, because in your book, Camille, I really appreciate that you said this about our study of these women. You said, studying these women requires us to give attention to these four women, their unique challenges, and their ultimate voices. Then you say this, such an exploration will add clarity to our understanding of Mary's foreordained mission, as well as that of Jesus. Hopefully their stories will encourage our own discipleship with the Lord. I want us to think about that. And we're going to answer that question at the end of this episode. How has these women's stories encouraged our discipleship with the Lord? And we're both going to answer that. And I want everyone to be thinking about that as you hear the stories of these four women. So let's do this. Let's talk about these four women. And we're going to start with Tamar. And um, you know what? I just, Camille's going to teach us about her. But I do have to tell you this because you'll appreciate this story. So when I was a little girl, there was a very famous book that came out and it was a book called Baby Names and What They Mean. And my friend brought it to school and we were so excited to look up all of our names in this book. And I can remember going around, every girl looked up her name and it was super exciting because, you know, we get to Sarah and it's princess. Amy, my beloved. Elizabeth was, oh, I like this one. Elizabeth means God is my oath. Oh, and then Tiffany was appearance of God and the name Jeanette is God is gracious. So of course, I'm so excited to find out what my name's going to mean. And I'm last and the book comes to me and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to see what it means. And I look up Tamra and it comes from Tamar and it means palm tree. (laughs) I was so deflated on that playground. I was nothing beautiful or princess. It was palm tree. But then my study of Tamar, And my study of how significant a palm tree is and what it symbolizes makes me so grateful my name comes from her name. So with that little bit of a buildup, tell us about Tamar and what is her story? Oh, it is a fascinating story, mostly because what it does, how it affects Judah. Mm -hmm. Judah, the son of 
Jacob and Leah, the fourth son. And you have to remember right before this, the chapter before is when their brother Joseph comes to see them out in the fields and they come up with the idea, let's put him in the pit, then Reuben leaves. And then while Reuben is away, Judah comes up with this idea, ah, mercenary mind that he had. Let's <laughs> sell him to the Midianites that are coming by. And then we can make, and tell our father that some animal killed him. Yep. That was Judah that did that. I mean, he is a pill, if the very, <laughs> to say it kindly. And then after this, the next time we really see Judah alone, it is when they're trying to go to Egypt to try to get grain because there's a famine where their father is and joseph is there but they can't recognize him in all of his royal robes the same mm -hmm. one that judah sold off joseph doesn't tell them and he joseph works it out so that he can falsely accuse benjamin of stealing from him and therefore keep Benjamin. And it's in that setting, this chapter 44 of Genesis, you look back there and look at Judah now. Judah in that case puts himself out and says, you take me, it'll kill my father if Benjamin, we lose him too. We've He's already lost Joseph. No, don't take mm -hmm. Benjamin, take me instead. And remember it brings Joseph to tears when he finally tells him. And you think, what happened to Judah? Right. He changes. And the only explanation is this chapter 38 of Genesis. That is our, our one story about Tamar. Mm -hmm. And it starts out that, that Judah went down. This is verse one, went down from his brethren and turned into a certain Adulamite whose name was Hera. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite. So Judah leaves his family, he leaves, leaves his religion, he goes and lives among the Canaanites and marries a Canaanite woman. Mm -hmm. And they have three children, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. And Judah chooses a wife for Ur, his oldest, and he chooses Tamar. We don't know any background, we don't know like I said, whether she's of the covenant lineage or if she's one of the Canaanites. Tamar marries her. He's wicked. The Lord takes his life. So she is married to the next brother as part of that law that said she's part of the family and she, can own, she needs to give birth to a child in her first husband's name. Mm -hmm. Well, that second son was just as bad, if not worse than the first, and the Lord takes him. And Judah is worried if he marries her off to the third son, he will die too because he's just like his brothers. So he sends her home yep. to live with her family. That's the only thing she can do until Shayla is old enough. That's his excuse. But think this, there is no future for Tamar at all. Right. She cannot marry anyone else. Um, she belongs to Judah's family. And so she waits. And all we know is that time goes by. We don't know how much time. Well, and I think one of the things we've learned this, this last year is that women were a marginalized group of society, but the most marginalized and disenfranchised were widows, yes. women without a husband. So when you say there and was without nothing a son. Tamar, yeah, and without a son, there was nothing, there was no hope for Tamar. So she will be not taken care of. And, and it seems like Judah's happy with her there. It's like he doesn't want her anymore in the family. Yeah. yeah. But there's no other family. If she marries someone else, it's death to her. Mm -hmm. So she, uh, Judah's not coming to see how she's doing. She's just stuck there in her parents' home. She hears that Judah's coming by um, to, uh, for sheep shearing and not right through her village. And so she wants to go meet him. But for a woman just to go out there alone to meet one of these groups of men coming by doesn't look very good. Right. And I think it's interesting. She takes off her widow's garments and she covers herself with a veil. Um, Which is a symbol of being a virgin or not married. Is that right? 
Well, it, it's veil. a modesty. It is modesty. Mm -hmm. There was an ancient law that said prostitutes could not wear veils. Right. Because you have to show who you are. I mean, this is your you're out there and letting people know. Mm -hmm. um, Judah thinks she's a, a harlot because he doesn't recognize her. She's sitting there alone. He just assumes that. Um, a lot of times people have said, oh, well, she was dressed like a harlot. She is not. <laughs> she's not at all. The scripture doesn't say she's hoping to look like a harlot. Judah thinks she is. Yes. And it's and it, when she sees that Shayla right there with Judah is old enough and that Judah's not going to give him to her as a husband. And that Judah comes then to her and propositions her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's I think it's at that moment Tamar says he's part of the family. You know, if his yeah. sons isn't. It was legally in her rights that she could have a child by him. Mm -hmm. And so without letting him know who she was, that she was his daughter-in-law, she accepted the proposition with added one little thing first. She says, what will you pay me for this? You want to play the game? I'll play the game. <laughs> I love how you put that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said, oh, I'll send some animal for you. And she goes, but until then, what will you give me? Mm -hmm. and, she, and she goes, I'll, 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 t I'll tell you what I'd like. I would like your signet. It's probably a signet ring on a cord is, is what the Hebrew seems to indicate. That would be a very personalized piece of jewelry or artifact mm -hmm. that would, he would put a seal on something to let people know this really is from him. Yep. And also his staff, which probably is personalized. Right. She's so smart. smart. She's very wise. He's very wise and, and she's covering her bases here. And so he goes, great, fine. I'll send you the kid afterwards. And so after this little liaison, Tamar finds out she is pregnant. Judah goes on his way, remembers, oh yeah, I got to pay that off. So he sends an animal by his friend to pay the harlot that's in town. Everyone in town says, there's not a harlot here. You know, who is that? <laughs> and so you learn something about about Judah in that his response is yep. let her have it her way. Then if she's going to not take this, lest we be shamed. He was more concerned about what people thought about him mm -hmm. than about being fair to this woman. And all is good. Three months later, what happens at word people find out Tamara is pregnant and the automatic assumption. She has played the harlot. She's been unfaithful to the family. So the word comes to, Judah. Mm -hmm. And what happens? Judah said, well, okay, if that she's going to do that, let her be burnt. I mean, that fast. She's that, gone. He is quick. Yeah. Like burner. Yep. And, and I love this verse. This is verse 25. This is Genesis 38, verse 25. When she was brought forth, it's like she's on her way to her death and she hasn't said <laughs> anything. She's waiting for the perfect moment. <laughs> when she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, Judah, right? Saying, she sent this message, by the man who these are, am I with child? Discern, I pray thee, whose are these? The signet, the bracelets, and the staff. Here these are. She's kept them there. Take this to my father-in-law. Say, here's the father of my child. And when Judah sees them, bing. Yep. Judah acknowledged them, verse Genesis 38, 26, and said, she hath been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Shayla, my son. And he knew her again no more. Um, he recognizes, not only has Tamar more righteous than Judah, that would be pretty easy at this point. But she is fully within her rights and privileges. And she has done this in a way that is perfectly legal and moral. Yeah. For truly those laws that are there. And so there you go. Oh. And what happens? It is a wake up call to Judah. And it I is. think he is different forever afterwards. She has twins. And I think it is interesting that you'll see that the number of people as they're as they're coming into Egypt. Jacob's family, Shayla is listed, and these two sons of Tamar, I think Tamar's got to be there too. Mm -hmm. And then when afterwards they leave with Moses, 
And you see all those, the descendants of Shayla are there and the descendants of these two boys are there. Um, truly, Tamar saved that lineage and oh opened gosh. the way for Judah to receive the promised blessing that the, that the scepter will not depart from his lineage until Shiloh or the Messiah comes. Yeah. Okay. Oh gosh, Camille, that was so good. Well, and then as you're talking, I'm going back to her name, Tamar, which is a palm tree, which is a symbol for victory. And mm. um, palm fronds are waved when the savior enters. It is a symbol of being upright, ultimate triumph and faithful. And I, I think this is so cool because you talked about the genealogy, those two sons, the twins, and we're going to connect that now to the story of Ruth. So Ruth is the next woman who's mentioned and, ah, oh, she's my woman. I love Ruth. Her name in Hebrew means friendship, and she comes into the story in the book of Ruth as a Moabitess. She is not an Israelite, and she marries into a family of Israelites, and there are two sons in that family, and Ruth and Orpah marry into this family, and they move. The whole family moves to Moab, and the sons die, and the husband dies, leaving Naomi and Ruth and Orpah without husbands. Again, marginalized, disenfranchised, they have nothing. And so Naomi says to her two daughters-in-law, look, you guys can go, just go back and live with your families. And Orpah does. But the, the awesome verse from Ruth, where she says in Ruth chapter one, verse 16, Oh, it's so beautiful. Entreat me not to leave thee or return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God, my God. That is her conversion line right there. Thy God, my God. And so through her conversion and becoming an Israelite, she and Naomi go back into the land where Naomi is from and they get taken care of by a man named Boaz. And listen, go read the story. It is so awesome because Ruth and, and the relationship between Ruth and Naomi is so beautiful. And Naomi says to Ruth, go and glean in this field of a kinsman that's near to us. There's nobody else they're related to that Ruth could marry. And I, I think it's interesting because Naomi does say to Ruth and Orpah, listen, I, I don't have any more sons. And what, are you going to wait for me to get married and then have more children and let those sons grow up so you can marry them through the law of Moses? And so she's like, just go and take care of yourselves. But Ruth stays. And when they come back, they realize, oh, I have a near kinsman. His name's Boaz. We can glean in his field. And there is an awesome law of Moses in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 through 10, is the law that allows for widows and fatherless to glean from the fields in the four corners. So Ruth goes and gleans and meets this man named Boaz. And you get this beautiful story, this beautiful relationship between the two of them, where ultimately then Boaz and Ruth will get married. But what I think is so significant is in the genealogical line in Ruth, at the very end in chapter four, we have the, the line where it starts in verse 18. Now, these are the generations of Perez, and Perez is one of the twin sons of Tamar. So here we get it plugged back in and we have Pharaoh's begat Hezron, Hezron begat Ram, Ram begat Aminadab, Aminadab begat Nashon, and Nashon begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz, and Boaz begat Obed. And then through that, Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David, who we get the genealogical line of Jesus Christ through. And so here we have this beautiful story of these two women who are so wise, Naomi and Ruth, and Ruth's wisdom in becoming converted following her, her mother-in-law's advice, she marries Boaz and they have the, the line again, here we go. I mean, I just love how in all these stories, it gets saved through the wisdom of these women. Anything else you want to add about Ruth? Well, one thing, if we go with that fourth theory of, um, of why these four women were included, that there was something irregular that could be perceived as scandalous. It seems Ruth doesn't fit that unless you say what happened on the threshing room floor. Right. And at least Boaz was concerned as Ruth had gone there to meet him secretively mm -hmm. at midnight in the middle of the night, a, a lone woman among all these men. He was worried that if she were seen, people would come to conclusions about mm -hmm. her own morality and so he was very careful to try to keep her hidden until a time that she could leave without people seeing her. But there's something as far as the implication in here, perhaps by Matthew adding it, 
perhaps someone did. And perhaps there were those that did falsely accuse her mm. of, um, of something there. But um, her story is one that we see whatever was happened before or what people thought was rumored, she is seen as truly a great one that all the Israelites would be proud to be connected with oh, uh, as far absolutely. as part of their people. So, well, and one of the things I thought was so awesome about her story is how often they use the word has said. There is so much has said throughout the book of Ruth, which connects with friendship, but we have studied has said this past year with old Testament, which is just this most incredible divine love, but it's like a reciprocal love where the Lord feels has said for us, which is mercy, kindness. Like it's everything. It's not just one feeling, but it's like a covenantal love that the Lord has for us because we're keeping our covenants. And there is this has said throughout Ruth because of what she has done and what the Lord will do for her and what she does for people. And so it's really pretty phenomenal to me when we think of that word in conjunction with Ruth and in conjunction with Rahab, because yes. that word is throughout Rahab. So Camille, tell us about Rahab. Okay. I'm in Joshua chapter two, and then we're going to go over to Joshua chapter six. Okay. Context. This is the children of Israel um, are ready to come into the promised land. Moses has been translated. Joshua is leading the people. And he sends a couple of Israelite spies into Jericho, the first city where they plan to first conquer and to spy out the land. And those two spies enter. We don't know how long they are there um, and where they go, but they at least the one place where they, they find success <laughs> is at a harlot's name, a harlot who is named Rahab. And mm -hmm. her house is on the wall. Probably that it was a walled city, Jericho, that had a double wall and, and homes that would have been right inside that wall. It was like an added barricade for the city um, that you would have very wide walls and then people living there. It would be the more dangerous place, I guess, for people to live. And that not surprising mm -hmm. maybe that... Rahab would be there. And what we know about her, yep, she's a Canaanite. She's, she's a harlot. And I think we don't need to shy away from that. Um, that's part of the I story. Agree. And it's yes. very important. And third, she has her own business there at this um, wine selling ale house or whatever. <laughs> and where people, people stayed, um, perhaps a brothel. I mean, you don't know while it is, but her family depends on her for right. a living and they're going to depend on her for their very physical lives as well. And she's, she's that she's the caretaker for her mother, her father, her brothers and sisters. And it looks like maybe even another generation. And, and so, you don't know, but these spies come in and she seems to make that connection pretty fast because soon she hides them up on her roof and the, the people from the king come in, the city-state of Jericho, there's a king, and he sends up saying, there, there are some of these Israelites that are coming to spy out the land. And they said, where are they? And that fast, she knows that they don't think she's very smart, that she can't mm -hmm. come up with anything. She said, oh, yeah, they were here, but they left. If you go really fast, you can probably catch them. But go out the gate because they were heading that way. She sends them out then races up to the roof. And now she wants to talk religion with yeah. these spies. <laughs> I think it, we get to hear her voice. I think it is a fascinating. I just want to take a look at a few of these verses in chapter two of jo Joshua verse nine. She said to the man, I know. And that word no here is more than cognitive. This right. is more like a, a spiritual knowledge mm -hmm. too. Remember Jethro, Moses's father-in-law used that word when he said, I know now after Israel had been delivered from Egypt. Now I know. Um, Sariah um, in the Book of Mormon says that after her sons come back safe from with the brass plates. Now I know I of know. a surety yeah. that m the Lord has sent us here. And um, oh, Naaman, Naaman, the Syrian captain. Mm -hmm. After he's healed of his leprosy, he says, I know it's the same word. I know now that Hebrews God 
is the only true God. It's that same thing. And this is, this is Rahab. She said, I know that the Lord, it's all in caps. That means Jehovah. Mm-hmm. Canaanites had a whole pantheon of gods. And the gods lived less morally than the people did. I mean, they're not good examples. But here she said, I know that your God, Jehovah, hath given you the land. Now, notice she even says that prophetically. They oh, haven't got does. the land. They haven't even started to conquer. Yep. But she knows this is in Hebrew. Do you know that the prophetic, it's called the prophetic perfect. It allows you to say something in the present tense that hasn't happened yet. It is truly faith. The assurance of things hoped for, even when evidence is unseen. I know he's already given you that like the land. And then she talks about how much we have learned about what you have done, the, that, that Jehovah dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. And she knows all these stories of how they have conquered. Um, I, I've often wondered if when you cross-reference this with 1 Nephi chapter 17, verses 32 through 35, mm-hmm. and 2 Nephi chapter 25, verse 9, if you don't see that the Lord said that the Canaanite, the people of the Canaanites were destroyed when the Israelites came in because they rejected the word of the Lord. Right. And if you say that, what does that seem to, that suggests they were taught it first. Correct. Yeah, I agree. And somewhere in that Rahab has heard this and she yeah. believes and she believes and, and I'm so, just imagining the spies, their reaction, like their eyes must just be like, well, wait, what? Yes. You're a believer. We did not expect to find this in Jericho. Yes. And, and especially in this house. house. I know yes. you yes. probably came here purposefully. I mean, it's just interesting that they chose to go there. You wonder if God guided them to exactly Jericho's house of all the places they could have gone. They chose a pretty scandalous place. Yes. And yes. they're having this experience. It's so and, cool. and, and overcoming any kind of stereotypes they might right. have had and anything Absolutely. good come out of Jericho and especially this house. Right. And as soon as we had heard these things, this is chapter two, verse 11 of Joshua. As soon as we heard these things, we Canaanites here, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you for Jehovah, your God. He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. And then she says, verse 12 of chapter two of Joshua. Now, therefore, I pray you swear unto me by the Lord. If you look in the footnotes, covenant with me. Mm -hmm. Since I have showed you this chesed, that you will also show that chesed back to my father's house. And so if you'll save me alive and my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters, I'll help you get out of here. And they make this covenant. They yep. show this, this lasting kindness, this said to each other. And he said, okay. And he, she lets them out of her house with, a, it says a, a, a scarlet or a, a cord, a line of scarlet in Joshua 2.18. Mm-hmm. And he, they said, okay, you let get us out here and don't tell anybody about us. When we come back to conquer the land, we'll save you. But keep this scarlet rope or cord out here and get all your family in the house. When you see this happening and you stay in this house and we'll get you out. That's, that's the covenant they make. And there you go. There's chapter two, right? Oh, yes. So go to six. Okay. Tell us so what happens in about that scarlet thread. So, so now you get, and he, they come back with this fabulous report to Joshua. I think their faith is emboldened because of the testimony of Rahab. Yeah. And they're ready. And you know, the walls of Jericho come tumbling down as they go around seven times. But Joshua said, everything is accursed. Everything is utterly destroyed except Rahab. And her family. So, chapter 6, verse 22 Joshua said to the two men that had spied out the land, Go to the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman and all that she hath. And so they do. Um, They have to stay outside the city for a little while. That was important. It was probably the very safety measure that they had learned after war to make sure disease isn't brought in. 
But we read, look at verse 25, chapter 6, Joshua 6, verse 25. And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father's household and all that she had. And she dwelleth in Israel even until this day. Mm. This was probably written long after the fact. It's probably descendants how far down that actually um, he would have known to say this. So this tells you the, the legacy already that is started with Rahab. Yeah. And what is fascinating to me is even in New Testament times, the valiant efforts and testimony of Rahab are remembered. In Hebrews 11, that very roll call of the faithful, mm-hmm. where it, where it's de- faith is defined as the assurance of things hoped for, even when evidence is unseen. Rahab is mentioned as one who had so much faith that she acted um, and saved these men. And then in James chapter two, we read James bring up Rahab as one of two examples, Abraham and then Rahab as one who showed faith and works. It's not just faith and believing, but you show it by your works. And she's in both places called Rahab the harlot. Her name means broad. Mm -hmm. I like to think of it as the net, the gospel net of the Savior has been enlarged and is broad to include all. This Canaanite harlot belongs Mm -hmm. in the gospel net. And she rescued um, Israel on that day. I'm so thankful that you taught us what her name means because that's it really struck me that this idea that it was a foreshadowing of this inclusion, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about inclusion to anyone and everyone. And so, because I remember learning her name at first to be large or enlarge. I'm like, well, that's, that's a terrible, like I thought Tamar, <laughs> the palm tree was bad for me. <laughs> I hate to read Tamra means large, but it means broad or wide. It, it means inclusion of anyone and everyone in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And she is the perfect example of who does the Lord include? all the Rahabs of the world. It's beautiful. So thank you for sharing that story with us. And so then it leads us to our last woman. And the scriptures say, it doesn't say her name. So it does say of her that had been the wife of Urias. So this is Bathsheba. And oh, she, I just have to start because my favorite thing about Bathsheba is her name. When Mm -hmm. I learned this in Hebrew, this is like a turning point for me because it's two Hebrew words. It's Bat and Sheba. And bot means daughter and Sheva means oath or covenant. So her name literally means daughter of the covenant or daughter of the oath. And then you, you dive into the story about her. And now this story, so many people, there are two sides to this story. You either hate her or love her. <laughs> and I think it's so interesting because people who hate her are like, well, she shouldn't have been bathing on the top of her roof. She, she purposely did that. So a man would see her naked. And of course, David saw her and wanted to be with her. But then you realize why she was bathing on the roof and how it was. Oh, 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 can I do? Please you read. You read it. Yes. You notice Bathsheba is never on the roof. The one that's on the roof is David. Oh, you're totally right. Duh. Yes. Yes. Tell it's us not. That. And you know where the, the palace is because the temple is built the highest yes. point in Jerusalem. And so the city of David is all below. He's on his roof. He can see everything. There's no evidence that Bathsheba's out parading buck naked on no, the roof. Because right. she would have been in a mikvah, which would have been in the ground. You're totally right. Yes. Yes. That, and thank maybe you. she wasn't <laughs> even in a mikvah. Maybe she was doing a it, little sponge. I mean, you know, we whatever know. she was. Yeah. Yes. Well, whatever she was doing, she was ritually cleaning herself because that is what women did at the day of, at the end of their menstrual cycle. At the, when you finished your period, you were unclean for seven more days. And then on the eighth day, you would have to wash your body that you were ritually clean again. And so that's what she was doing. She was performing that ordinance that now she was ritually clean and David sees her. And again, I think it's interesting because it starts in second Samuel chapter 11, verse one. The first thing it tells us is at the time when kings go forth to battle. And so you kind of wonder, well, where, why was David not at the war? There's so many different thoughts on that, but he probably should have been. And if he had been at war, would this have happened? But again, maybe it was all supposed to happen because we get the genealogical line of the savior through it. 
But Bathsheba is seen as being sort of this scandalous woman, but she's a daughter of the covenant. And I think she's a believer. And then you go into this verse of scripture, which I think was so cool. It's pointed out and you did this in your book. And it's really important for us to notice that when you see a word in italics, it's added by those who translated and it changes the way this verse reads. So we go into verse in second Samuel chapter 11, verse three. So he sees her washing herself and verse three says, and David sent and inquired after the woman. And there's the word one in italics. If we take that out, it doesn't say one said is not that Bathsheba. It actually kind of implies that David knew who it was. And David sent and inquired after the woman and said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Mm -hmm. Like he knew who she was and he knew who Uriah the Hittite was because Uriah was like his right-hand man. Uriah was a bodyguard. He was one of 30 mighty men listed in the scriptures. He, for the military captains at this time, he was a trusted warrior and David knew him very well. And what and does so, his name mean in Hebrew? Oh, his name means my light is Jehovah. Yeah. So David then did. In verse four, it says, David sent messengers and took her. I think there's something significant about the word took right there. Um, how much of this was Bathsheba's decision? How much of it was she just had to do it because he was king? I don't know. What are your thoughts, Camille? Yeah, it is. We don't know. The, the focus is on David. It isn't Bathsheba. So we don't really have her feelings in this. Mm -hmm. um, and And the culpability the Lord places on David as well. Yes. Well, and in verse four, he knew that she was purified from her mm -hmm. uncleanness. So then she does become pregnant by David. And then there's a cover up. And it's just so fascinating to me in this story because it, David didn't ultimately get in trouble for having wow. sexual relationships with Bathsheba. David got in trouble because he made an arrangement where Uriah would then be killed. He sent him on the front lines of war to make sure that he would be killed in war so that he could cover up this pregnancy. But he actually first tried to cover it up by sending your, he bringing Uriah off the battlefront and said, go see your wife, go and be with her. But Uriah is such make a nobleman. Make him think that that child was Uriah. Yes, exactly. But Uriah is such a nobleman that he's like, no, he slept by the door of King David. We're at war. He is mm -hmm. not going to leave the king until the war's over. And so when David wakes up in the morning and sees Uriah mm -hmm. sitting at his door, he's mad. Well, I told mm -hmm. you to go see your wife. And Uriah's like, that's not what I've been asked to do. Like, I am here to, to completely protect you. And so that's when the king then says, David's like, all right, I got to, we got to do something major. So he then, and it says, let's put Uriah on the front lines and Uriah is killed. So he actually had him murdered. And that is what the whole book of Psalms is then about is all of the cries and prayers of David for what he did in that instance. And um, so we have this story about this, then there's David and Bathsheba and their child passes away. And then she becomes pregnant again and gives birth to Solomon. And so then that's our lineage of Jesus Christ. Anything else to add about Bathsheba? I just think there in first Kings chapter one, it is Bathsheba that goes to David before he dies and ensures that Solomon is made the king because there was another of David's sons mm -hmm. that was politicking to be king. And there was, uh, it seems right from the get go, the Lord had promised that it would be Bathsheba's son of all David's wives. It's Bathsheba's son that will be the next king. And that lineage goes through there. It's going to be Bathsheba's son who builds the temple in Jerusalem. It's um, yep, and 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 she orchestrates that with the prophet. She she and Nathan the prophet. You can just see they there's a, a special bond there, and they understand each other. And Nathan the prophet trusts Bathsheba. So much wisdom. Mm -hmm. I mean, story after story are these women who are so wise in their ability to orchestrate the situation and circumstances to do what the Lord always had intended. Like I, mm -hmm. I love that word wisdom. So there are stories about our women. Those are the women that are included in the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter one. So now we're going to go back to that question we thought about as we've discussed these women. How have these stories encouraged our own discipleship? And I want to know from you, Camille, how has that worked? And then I'll share my experience. Well, I, I just think no matter who you are, no matter what your background is, no matter what you feel like your gifts and talents from God are, 
the Lord has need of you. And these women show in, in situations where in some cases they don't, almost all these cases, they're really limited in, in what they are able to do in the mores of society and legally um, and, and expectations that people would have. But they found a way to be true to their testimony. They found a way to be true to their God-given talents and made contributions that changed the future of Israel. Mm -hmm. And even though um, we don't talk about them all so much, uh, Matthew thought it was of great importance. And so to me, it tells me that I don't have to be a leader politically or in a community or militarily, um, which they were men that did that. But women were often rescuers. And we women have opportunities to do things within our sphere of influence that truly rescue those that the Lord has anointed. Wow. Well said. In fact, when you said that, that Camille, that hit my heart. Like the spirit was like, that is 100% true. What she just said. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for pointing out within our own sphere of influence, we have the ability to include and rescue. Oh, so good. Uh, my answer that how they have encouraged my discipleship goes back to what their names mean. Like I was studying it, looking over again, what their names mean. And I just thought, wow, we have victory, friendship, inclusion, and daughter of the covenant. And I thought I can do that. I can. I just thought that is what it means to be a follower of Christ, to be a daughter of the covenant, to have victory and friendship and inclusion. Yes, that is what I can do with my sphere of influence, with the people that I love to be inclusive of everybody, to be their friends, to teach about the victory of Jesus Christ. Um, that That's what it means for me in the covenant relationship that I have. And so that I, I appreciate so much what these women's names mean in context of my own life. And um I think they were all of those things. Every example we studied is an example of victory, an example of friendship and of inclusion and of covenants. And so those, that was pretty cool to know their names and how every, all four of them were those. And then you get to marry. I mean, the last one in the line, she is victorious. She is a friend. She is inclusive. She is a daughter of the covenant. And so it's neat that it ends with that. So thank you for sharing. One day we will get to meet them and won't that be delightful. And and just awesome. I'll stand in line with you. I'll stand next to you. I'll, I'll stand in line behind you. You should get to go before me. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> I'll go next, but, oh, I can't wait to meet them. I just, like, I just want to see them, what they look like, you know? And uh, and get the rest my, of the stories. Oh, no kidding. To hear the rest of their stories. I think that's awesome. And you know what, Matthew? Thank you. Thank you for including these women because it gives us a great opportunity to talk about them, share their stories, learn from them, and then to just, again, encourage our own discipleship because of their examples. So thank you, Camille. This is a great discussion of these women. I am so excited for this year. Wow. So that's it. That ends our discussion of women of the New Testament. So thank you, friend. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today for our first episode of Unnamed Women of the New Testament. Again, this is a special bonus series from the Sunday on Monday podcast, and it's brought to you by LDS Living and Deseret Bookshelf Plus. The Sunday on Monday podcast is a Come Follow Me podcast where we take the Come Follow Me lesson for the week and we really dig into the scriptures together. If you want to know more information about this podcast, click in the link in our description or go to ldsliving.com slash Sunday on Monday. You can also go to deseretbook.com slash Sunday on Monday and sign up for a free 30-day trial of Desert Bookshelf Plus, where you will find the podcast Sunday on Monday. This episode is produced by Cole Wissinger and me. It is edited by Haley Hyam, and it is recorded by Mixet 6 Studios. Our executive producer is Aaron Hallstrom. We'll see you next week, and please remember all of you wise women and men that you are God's favorite.